welcome to the sixth edition of the ATU Library Webinar Series. And my name is Ajiban Chudak, who I'll be your moderator today. Um, I'm also supported by Dr. Glenn Jima. Dr. Glenn Jima, can you hear me? Yes, please, I can hear you. All right, welcome. Well, thank you very much. So Doc will be my co-moderator on this um, amazing webinar series for today. And we wouldn't want to miss where, so go straight to our first item on the outline, which is to um, call on the Vice Chancellor to give an initial welcoming address. My name Good is morning. Professor Amelia Kapovi, and I am the Pro Vice Chancellor of Accra Technical University. Let me share with you my great joy and pleasure to stand in the shoe of my boss, the Vice Chancellor of Accra Technical University, Professor Samuel Ni Odai, to share some few words of introduction with you as we begin um, today's seminar, which is the sixth of the series seminars organized by our library and also in partnership with the Directorate of Research, uh, Innovation and Technology Transfer. Um, this is again partnered, uh, we partner uh, our colleague from the Association of African University. We thank them very much to be on board with us. And particularly today, the theme is on the trends in academic writing and publishing in an ongoing pandemic. I am very delighted to be called upon to say some few words because you see, since the advent of this pandemic, where we have to first of all lock down and go back to our home, whilst we were fully in academic year, I kept asking myself a number of questions. But along the line, I realized that this has also, though is an unfortunate event to some extent, it had also opened ways for people to think otherwise and to do things a bit differently from how we used to do them. With this, most of activities have moved online instead of being face-to-face -face and physical. So therefore, we get even a bit more times to care for things we used not to do. And with time and the pressure of life, people have forgotten a bit above God, waking up in the morning, drinking some tea, having some exercise, reading Bible, and then praying before even going to the daily activity. But all these have been long forgotten. With this advent that people have been put back home, I think many of us have revived this, and I think we are still doing that. And this brings about um, the mind on academic writing as well. For us, academic writing is very key. That's why in the academic world, it is said that you either publish or you perish. Reading and writing actually are two key activities that keep us awake and alive. Through reading, we nourish our souls with quite a number of new knowledge and then uh, wisdom is all that we need to live. And then through writing, we express our mind and then our feeling and our desires. With this new pandemic, we have fought more times at home and also with the advent of the open access journal, we are able to write even more than we used to do. And therefore, we start thinking, what about our colleague at the academic staff or non-academic staff who work in the same environment with us? And yet again, we we'll also need to enjoy this benefit. Yet, when you think about non-academic staff, you may have to think twice. They find themselves as big administrators, sometimes managing academics and taking very key decisions. Some of the decisions we take can transform the whole direction of a university, can transform the way students, staff, and then even other stakeholders find satisfaction in the services we deliver as a university. And therefore, some of these decisions need to be made on basis that are solid, on foundations that are well built, on arguments that are, that are well developed with supporting evidences. And this again, it brings the art of writing again. So it is difficult to say that we have non-academic staff. In fact, everybody working in university should be seen as an academic staff. As far as you can make decisions that change the course of a university, which are funded on relevant argument, and you're able to perform a literature search, see how this is done in analogous institutions, and bring them together and make a case, then you are arguing and doing the same thing lecturers are doing to write their academic papers. Therefore, I think this seminar come at the right point to empower you with the tools 
and then they needed uh, skills to be able to write position papers to express your view in a very academic manner because you see when we fail to express our view academically we tend to use violence and force which usually do not solve problem in an academic uh, you know uh, environment so this is a very great seminar in my view the objective is to empower us especially we administrators managers to have the necessary um, the, the necessary um, requirement or requisite to be able to write academic papers in a manner that makes sense, in the manner that makes impact, in the manner that change people's life. Position papers, how to communicate an idea from the author that is bringing something, maybe an idea in management, and um, to do things better and to make the university grow. But they are not just ideas thrown or written anyhow. They have to be written according to um, uh, academic skills. You know, I don't know what to say again, but you need to really prove that what you are writing makes sense. Is a standard thing. It's something that is done in other universities. So how do you then quote other people? How do you perform literature review? How do you summarize ideas? How do you argue? How do you go about data collection? How do you justify your case? There are quite a lot of mysteries that I believe that um, attending today's seminar will bring to uh, clarity and help all of us to improve our service delivery to the university as a whole. On this note, I thank you very much. I thank the university library and the TRIPT and also the AAU. And I wish you a fruitful deliberation and a wonderful day. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much um, from the vice chancellor, pro vice chancellor of the uh, Catholic University for giving us your welcome and address. We would want to remind our participants that is the sixth edition of the ATU Library webinar series seminar uh, on the theme trends in academic writers and publishing in an out ongoing pandemic. And we have two sub teams. The first one, which is the art of academic reports writing for non-teaching staff. And the second one, which is the mechanism of writing position papers. And I want to also acknowledge the presence of our um, chairperson who is Professor Samuel Neodai, Vice Chancellor of the ATU, and also our speakers, Mrs. Caroline Anane, senior lecturer and former um, AG at AG at the principal ATU, and also Dr. Idris William Tanko, deputy registrar and campus registrar, University of the Wallabata Studies, Chamale, Ghana. You're welcome to the first webinar series. So we're now inviting um, Mrs. Caroline Anane. I will first of all tell us a bit about Mrs. Caroline in a short while. So our next speaker, uh, who is Mrs. Caroline Anane, uh, has been lecturing at the ATU for the past 30 years, between 1998 and 2010. She held various positions in the institution. She was head of Department of Secretaryship and Management Studies, and then Dean of the School of Business and Management Studies. She also became the Hall uh, mistress and Dean of Students Affairs from 1999 to 2003. And she was a vice principal. She was also the acting principal from 2001 to 2002. Currently, Mrs. Anane is a senior lecturer in the Liberal Studies and Communication Technology Department at the ATU. Mrs. Caroline Anane, if you are with us, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll be taking you through report writing for the non-teaching staff. And this is my presentation outline. I hope my screen, you have, I've shared my screen, you can see. Yes, can yes, see? yes, yes, Mrs. Okay. So this is my presentation outline. Basically, see what the report is. Gives a few steps to consider before you write. General format for reports, the types of reports. And I'll give a sample report as in the actual writing of it, so like in a practical manner. And then a few presentation tips. So generally a report is any document that is supposed to examine a problem for the purpose of conveying information or reporting findings, or putting forward ideas. So we basically want to say that the report is, a, is an account of something that you've heard, seen, or done. It can be verbal, but in most cases it is written, because at the end of the day, you want some uh, proof or documentation that something has been done. So let's look at a few useful steps that we can take or you can use before you write your report. First and foremost, you need to identify the audience to which the report is being written. 
So what do you need to, what do they need to know? What is best left out? So for example, let's take annual reports that for what do you do? So at the end of or anyone who needs to know how that organization has performed over the year. So generally, just to say that identify your audience and know exactly what type of information should go to them. Then know your objectives. Uh, what, what are you trying to achieve with the report? Basically, what generally you want the report to achieve for you? Use the right style, which is which best suits the organization. I think there are a lot of in style type of writing, depending on what organization you are looking at. So use the style that fits your organization that you are dealing with, if there are any in styles. Then try to read over your work. A lot of times we take it for granted that the computer will do the correction, etc., for us, forgetting that sometimes it's, if it's a homophone, for example, it may be the correct spelling, but it is not the appropriate word. So we learn to read over our, our report that we write so that we correct every mistake, grammatical mistakes, uh, concepts, anything that at the end of the day would mar the beauty of that report. It's also a good practice to use visuals in your reports. I mean, so charts, graphs, diagrams, pictures, make use of visuals in the reports. Nowadays, we don't just want to see you writing all the time. We want to see some visuals. So make use of good visuals. If there are pictures you are going to use, make sure that the resolution is very good so that the thing comes out very well. Acronyms basically can have double meaning. So it is best that you write them out in full. So at first you write the whole word to so Akatrika University, for example, and then you put the acronym in brackets. If on the other hand, your report is going to have several of those acronyms, then it's best that you list all the acronyms in alphabetical order and write them out in full on a separate page. Protect intellectual property. I think this is a very important uh, issue, especially when it comes to academia or industry, not just academia, industry as well. So with the use of trademarks, copyrights, patents, as a means of protecting your work. So whether you're a scientist or researcher or university, you need to enforce these, uh, these terms that make use of them so that people know that it's a registered thing, they are, we take care of that, it's a trademark, fine, if it is um, copyright, the see will take, the, take care of that. So anywhere that you know that should have any of these that are put over there, that is the R, the TM, and the C symbol, you should ensure that you include it as part of your way. So let's look at the format generally. We look at it. Uh, so for the format, there's always supposed to be a title page. Table of contents is applicable if the report is a lengthy one, but if the report, report is not very lengthy, you may not necessarily need a table of contents. Then you need an executive summary if the report certainly is a lengthy one. So it's basically a brief of what the whole report is about. So it's supposed to give your reader a quick preview of the report's contents. And the purpose is to present the key points of the report in one place. Take the summary very concise and straight to the point. Let them read the executive summary and know exactly what the entire report is about. As I indicated, if the report is a lengthy one, then you need the table of contents and the executive summary. The title page also, if it's a lengthy one, you need the title page, but sometimes it may not be that lengthy, two or three pages. Then the title can be at the top of the same page that the other aspects will come from. Then try to, let's look at now the introduction and the terms of reference. The introduction basically tells, describes the context or gives a background to the report. So what is the report about? What are you describing? What problem are you talking about? Define the specific objective, the outcome. Then generally the that is basically the purpose of the report. Give the background, what exactly is this report about? What are you looking at? So then there are what we call the terms of reference or the TUR. It's basically giving an outline of the report scope. That is the extent of the investigation. To what extent that investigation you are doing is supposed to take you to. Then we come to the discussion. So present the analysis in a logical and systematic manner. It is necessary to divide your material with appropriate headings so that you improve the reader's understanding. So you don't bulk everything up with appropriate headings. I'll come to a practical aspect of it later, so that will help you to understand this. Try to back your claims with evidence. Explain your findings. I mean, don't just say something and then there's no evidence to prove what you are saying. And then try to link theory to practical issues. Persuade your reader of the validity of your stance. 
then it becomes so basically the discussion is taking care of the entire report itself, what exactly you are doing. Then you come to your conclusion. It's supposed to be arranged so that the major conclusions come first to identify your major issues related to the case and give your interpretation of them. Relate your specific objectives to the report and then follow logically from the facts in the discussion. You are basically concluding on what you have written, what your discussion is about. So at the, at the end of the day, make your, your conclusion emanate from the discussion. You should not just be conclusions from your or what you think, but basically what you, you discuss, you should draw your conclusion from. They try to be very brief and be clear, clean and be clean cut and specific with your conclusion. Your recommendations are supposed to be points to the future. And therefore, you should be action oriented, you should be feasible, that whatever you recommend to something that can be done. I mean, that's feasibility. It should be feasible, it should be logically related to the discussion and the conclusion. Whatever you concluded on, recommend based on this conclusion or based on the discussion you had. Number your recommendations, it, makes, it gives the eye a better way of accepting certain information and try to arrange it in order of importance. Try to be very clear. So then we have references, cite any references used in the reports, and then you have appendices if it is necessary, you give that. So the appendices are basically certain things that you may not, you have used, but it didn't really get directly to your table, perhaps now I need to be in the report. But they will be hey. 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 make use of that. Mm -hmm. If it is not directly related to the discussion, then put those things in mm. Generally, I've just taken you through things that you need to take note of if you have you are going to write your report. So now let's look at some types of reports. I try to look at the concept that I was dealing with non-teaching staff. So I picked two general areas of reports. I basically looked at one, the regular routine reports, which I know that non-teaching staff will write a lot, a lot because of their part of their job, those are the routine jobs. And then the commission reports or things like the committee's report or investigative report. So reports generally are classified according to their context. So because I'm looking at non teaching staff, I basically took these two areas, that is the regular routine reports, things that are part of your job or like progress report, periodic report, and then the specially commission reports where a committee has been set up and you are and member of that committee and you have to come up with your okay so let's look at the committee reports or what or more or less the investigative reports once the committee set up to go into basically the investigative one that you have to do the investigation so let's look at the investigative reports these are the the areas that you have to look at the title the introduction or type of reference the procedure or method the findings which you should put under section headings your conclusions and recommendations if you are asked for them. So I've given three different titles over here. I'm looking at report of the committee to investigate the accessibility of money and internet cafe. Report just these are just practical. I just want you to look at the practical level of writing the title, for example. So these are three different titles that these reports have already been written. So these are the titles that I teased out of some of the reports that out. So what I will focus more on is number one, that is report on the committee to investigate the feasibility of running an internet cafe. I'm teasing out a few areas with respect to these components. So for the title, I'm giving the title. So now let's go to the introduction. I just explained that the introduction is supposed to be like a background to the issue, what problem are you dealing with, etc. So a practical way of writing this type of introduction for this committee's report to be this committee was set up. So you basically say who set up the committee, what is it basically looking for? You give a little background for people to understand what the committee is set up for and for what purpose. And then because it's a committee, there should be some membership. So membership consists of I haven't put any information there, but generally just to tell you that you first give a little background as to say who set up the committee for what purpose and then who are the members of that type of committee you list all the members according to chairman, members, and secretary. Now, the terms of reference. So this particular report, the, the terms of reference means that what, what areas were they supposed to cover? So what was the scope of the report? 
you have to look into the issue of the university running an internet cafe, take into consideration the use of technology that allows many resources to a common system. So, and then any other related issues. So it's important that you write out, basically the terms of reference will be spelled out in the letter that is given to you. So in the report, when you are reporting back, you also write out for the terms of reference is. Now we come to the procedure. Procedure is basically, how do you come by the data to write the reports? So that is what the procedure is, or the method if you want to use that expression. So you basically will spell out exactly how you collected your data. So for this part committee, they had six sittings, and for the six sittings, they, they went out to collect some information. So they went to some institutions. So for this particular committee, they went to the University of Ghana and the Methodist University College to gather data. So basically, they went there to interview people to get information on what they, they were supposed to report on, finding out whether it is feasible to run an internet cafe here at the university campus. Then another aspect is not just interview people, you also have to do some observation, find out certain things. So what they were expected to do was the university campus was inspected for possible locations for the students. Because first you talk to people about it, but you also have to do some observation or go and look at things to see whether that will help you get information to do what you have been asked to do. Then the findings basically are what the, what did you find out when you went to out when you did your procedure, exactly what was found out. So just a few things that I choose that not the entirety of the findings, but just to help you to understand how to write findings. So you normally would have to give section headings for it so that people understand where this particular finding is coming from. So with respect to this particular internet cafe issue, University of Ghana and Methodist University were all visited. So basically what was found as what has been stated in that day saying that for the University of Ghana, they run their cafe on a commercial basis. However, it is open to the community. The cafe operates on 24 hours. Access is by customized ID. Basically, you, you tease out and pick out from the interviews what findings you got out of that information you got at the end of the day. With respect to the university college, uh, Methodist University College, theirs is open to the general public and they operate on a strict system. So I'm basically just explain that with the findings, you, you extract your findings from what you went to do, whether so if you interview people, they will say certain things based on what they said, certain findings should come out, and that is what you write out. Then, as I said, there were two types of procedures. Apart from the interview to the university to collect, they also went to uh, inspect the, the capacity to to accommodate a reasonable number of students. So basically what they also found out with the observation, what they also found out with the, whole, with the observation is what has been stated in that year. You make it as uh, punchy as possible, as to go straight to the point and say exactly what, what came out. So the first lab on the detail floor, for example, can take 96 students and the second can take 40 students. They are basically giving the account of issues so that people can understand things well. Then you come to your conclusion it, for this particular cafe, their conclusion based on their findings was that it's feasible to run an internet cafe for income generation. And then the other conclusion they drew was that modalities to run the cafe was to be adapted from both the two institutions or the two universities that they went to. So that is the, this conclusion is drawn out of the findings that they came up with. Recommendations. So for this particular committee, they recommended how the, the cafe can be run. So they indicated that it should be run both day and night and should cater for both the morning and the evening students. They also recommended that because of the large students, it should be restricted, restricted to the investing community alone. I'd like to say a little bit about the findings that some findings, depending on the type of report you are writing, if it's an investigative report, sometimes the findings should be verbatim. So it will depend on exactly what you are. So for example, let me just take you back a little bit. A report like the examination of practice committee, for example. Some, for that particular report, there should be a component of the report that has the verbatim reporting of what actually was, was discussed over there. But sometimes you realize some of these committees, people will have issues with it and you may want to take the issue up in court or whatever. So there should be something that to prove that this particular find that you, you came up with 
came out of these Everton reports. So that is for that type of uh, committee report. But for others, you don't necessarily need the Everton report. Okay, so now let's look at the progress report or the periodic report. Basically, reports that you as a non teaching staff or non academic staff, you are likely to write as part of your routine job. The first one I just explained are more for the committee one. So this is part of your routine job. But by all means, at the end of whatever you can ask to do, there's a report you should write. So I'll look at that as well. So I'll look at it. So for this one, just have the four components. The title is a standard thing for any report. With this one, it's either you give a background or you are introduced or you give the situational information, provide the findings or the analysis of the situation, like if an action was taken or a solution provided or a conclusion between the that. So a sample routine reports, I guess this is the title that I give to the that's the to this type of report. So it said report on workshop for administrative assistance and plans in modern principles. So the title should be should state a summary of exactly what is going on. So let's look at the introduction. The introduction basically is to let anybody after reading the introduction they should be able to tell you what the report is, is basically doing, what issue it is. So this is how the, the introduction was. It says what what it was expected, what is supposed to be done, who took part in it, when it took part. So the, the job views are very important. Who, what, when, why, how. And where they are basically some of the things you look at when you are introducing. I'm basically explaining what the introduction is saying. It tells me who took part, what the workshop is expected to do, how they're supposed to do it. And with the findings and the analysis of the situation, you basically, since the workshop was a two day, you basically talk about the things that took part in the two days, the, all the two days. So the first day, what exactly went on, it's, it's important. On it. By the section head, you should provide what they you want, whatever you report that they will do with it. Then, so you will vary it as to how you want to say, but basically, when you are reporting on this workshop, you basically talk about how all the two days, all the two days, sorry, so the first day, what, what happened, what were you taking to, how were you taking to, and so for example, this one is saying that participants were taking to the situation, and the first one is needed was this. this one, that. Then you go to the next topic. What did you learn under the next topic? So you are giving out those findings to the second class. Then you come to the third topic. Then the second day, you call it the same. What did you learn on that particular day? You deal with that. You explain the etc. So you, you basically want to say everything to because you're analyzing the situation. Then you come to your conclusion. You give your impression about the whole program and how beneficial or otherwise. I mean, it, like, but whatever it is. You draw your conclusion from your findings. So at the end of the day, give your impression about the whole thing, how the teacher is going to otherwise, and offer some suggestions with respect to that particular activity that you did. And you should always name, give your name, and then you sign, and then you provide the date. Every report has to be signed, put the name signed, even with the committee's one, all the committee members have to be signed, and then they do. A few uh, things about presentation. If you are going to present, try to be generous with space. So the subheadings, the headings are very important. Try to leave some spacing when you are dealing with your headings. Very large reports need some um, spacing in it. it. It helps people to be able to read exactly what you are talking about. And then use a consistent scheme of headings, subheadings, numbers, and indentations. Try to be very clear with your headings. So this type of heading is important. If the report is to be discussed at the meeting. Then everybody present will need to know how to refer quickly to one place or the other. So once the headings are there, the numbers are there, the chairperson or the chairman can tell me, let's go to page this uh, item one or item B or item whatever it is, whatever heading. It helps you to understand how issues are going, especially because of the it is going to be discussed at the meeting. Then Clarify your statistics and figures with diagrams where appropriate, so where you have to use some diagrams, make use of the diagram to help a lot. Help people to understand the issues better. And then finally, as I said, the report must be dated and signed. That is a very important thing because people want to know when that report came out. Please check it.
So in a nutshell, basically that's what the thoughts are all about. Looking at the two categories, I look at the quantity of the board and I look at the routine reports. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Caroline, uh, for your very, very um, amazing presentation on report writing. We'll now move to our next uh, speaker, who is Dr. Uh, Ibrahim Tanko. I would like to do a quick introduction of Dr. Ibrahim before he joins us. So, so Dr. Idrisu uh, M. Tanko joined the University uh, for Developmental Studies in November 2000 and rose through the ranks to Deputy Registrar um, in October 2020. He holds a PhD in Education, Leadership, Policy and Change from the University of Leicester, UK and an M.Ed. in Educational Administration as this IIUM Malaysia and a Bachelor's from the University of Ghana. He holds a Diploma in Higher Education Management from the Galilee Institute, Israel. He is a member of the Certified Institute of Human Resource Management, Ghana, and he holds certificates in leadership and project management. So, this gentleman, let's um, invite the presence of uh, Dr. Idris M. Tanko to give us the next presentation. Without much ado, I'd like to uh, share the screen with you and then start my presentation. Right. Um, good morning to colleagues from all the nooks and crannies of the country. Uh, I am going to do a presentation on how to write position papers for promotion with respect to non-teaching staff or non-academic staff. I prefer to use the, the term non-teaching staff because uh, as the provincy has indicated, everybody in the university is an academic, so there's nobody who is an academic. Thank you. Um, all right, so as the first uh, uh, presenter has done, the requirements for promotion in the university for non-teaching staff are varied. Whilst for our colleagues in the teaching profession or the teaching side, they require a number of publications published in peer-reviewed journals for administrators and professionals who are also senior members. We require some variety of documentation for our pro uh, promotion. In addition to a, uh, the technical report that the madam has just presented, we also need position papers as well as publications. So I'm not ruling out publications altogether. If you have one or two publications, that plays to your advantage, right? So for us as administrators and professionals, we need a variety. And one of the most important documents that we need for our promotion is what we call the position paper, right? Uh, having sat through appointments and promotion committees for the past seven years, I've learned that the emphasis for professional and administrative class is the position paper or the report that has already been deliberated on. You, you need one or two publications, but the emphasis should be on the position paper or the technical report. And essentially, as the pro VC said, it, it should make an input or an impact on university governance or administration, right? So without much ado, I will just uh, look at the rudiments or the requirements for putting up a position paper, right? So with the definition, a position paper is a technical write-up by an officer or an administrator on a specific issue that he or she identifies as a problem in his or her schedule that undermines uh, university governance, right? So in addition to a few publications, you also need to look at your area. If you are in procurement, if you are in finance, if you are in WPD, you need to look at your area and get a topical issue or something that is uh, uh, trending, something that is affecting the university governance. And you put up a position paper, and as I said, ultimately to enhance university governance. So it's, it's not just about writing anything. What you write should have an impact 
or it should, it should have an effect in the promotion of uh, university governance. So a position paper is, is, is a paper that we write that should consist of a very short introduction paragraph followed by longer paragraphs on the topic or for the topic. So it's, you are not writing for publication, but as much as possible, it should have the rudiments of a published paper, right? It should have an introduction, it will have a body and a, a conclusion. So what is the purpose of a position paper? The purpose of a position paper is to generate support on an issue. It describes the author's position on the issue and the rationale for that position in the same way that a research paper incorporates supportive evidence based on facts that provide a solid foundation for your argument, right? So as I said, it, it, it describes your position on the issue. In a short while, I'll pick one or two issues from the university that we will be looking at and practicalize it, right? So it's it, 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 it the same way that a research paper incorporates evidence. Your paper must also be what? Evidence-based, it should be based or supported by data or facts so that you provide a solid foundation for the author's argument. Right, so it is, it is a critical examination of a position using facts and inductive reasoning, which addresses both your strengths and weaknesses of the author's opinion. Right, so your write-up should look at both the merits and the merits of the issues, the weaknesses and the strengths, in such a way that when you are concluding, you are standing on a solid firm, a solid grounds to make your recommendations. Because as we said, ultimately, the recommendations should impact on university governance. So a classic position paper contains three main elements. Classically, there should be an introduction, which identifies the issues that are discussed and states the author's position on the issue. So that's the introduction. Your introduction should be clear, it should be vivid, it should, it should, it should, it should, there shouldn't be any ambiguity. You should lay a firm foundation for a takeoff, right? So when you get your introduction right, you have to look at the body, which is the second aspect of the position paper. It contains the central argument and is further broken up into three unique areas, right? So the body should have a background information of the issue that you seek to put across. The, the problem that you seek to address. Secondly, there should be evidence supporting your position. So having laid down the background information, you should have enough evidence. If it is a security problem, if it is a sanitation problem, if it is a problem of uh, uh, truancy, punctuality, there should be, you should have support, right? And the support should be said that it should be very authentic. It should be data-driven. So you need to do a number of what? and a re some form of research, do proper research to come out with facts and evidence. So a discussion on both sides should address and refute, or you should you have a contradiction on your position. Because you are not just stating your position, there are other uh, contrasting views. There are other views and you should, you, should make, you should create a balance. You should create a balance, you should be able to address the merits and demerits, and should look at other issues first about your problem. Then the third aspect is restating the key points. That's the conclusion. You should restate the key points where applicable and suggest resolutions to the issue. The conclusion is very important because it is at this stage that you make your recommendation. And as uh, the, the first presenter said, your recommendation should flow from your discussions. There should be a, a thread that weaves from your introduction to your body and to your conclusion. The recommendation should be very authentic and should tie into your discussion. If you haven't discussed anything in the body, nothing in the recommendation should, 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 should stand out uniquely. Right? What I'm, say, what I'm saying is that your recommendation should flow from your body, it should flow from the arguments that you have made. You don't recommend on anything that you have not discussed, All right? So let's look at this, this table. 
it will help us uh, to, to, to position ourselves. So you have the introduction where you have your general statement and you have your thesis statement, all right? You have your body and your body sh should be divided into one or two or three or four uh, uh, sections. The first topic we are dealing with, the other topics and so on, and how you support your conclusions. So the topic sentence should lead you to your concluding sentence. Please know that the body is the longest part of the essay and can contain as many paragraphs as necessary and support controlling ideas of your thesis statement, right? So again, to practicalize things, when we are writing a position paper, the paper should seek to address an issue. So what is it that you want to address? You should be very clear and unambiguous in the introduction. You should be very clear what you are, you are trying to address. If you are trying to address a security situation, if you are trying to address a sanitation problem, if you are trying to address a procurement issue, you should be very clear about what issue you are addressing so that yeah, right. if, your paper, hello, if your paper goes out for assess, assessment, the assessor shouldn't have a problem of trying to fish out what is the problem that you are discussing. So the issues should be very clear. Then you should also, within the body, please take time to talk about the causes of the problem. Why, why is it a problem? So in, in, if you look at a research paper, it should be what we, we call the problem statement. What are the causes of the issue? Why, why is it a problem in your university or in your institution? There should be a need, right? There should be a need for you to address that issue. You don't just pick any issue that is of no relevance. It should be properly addressed and it should seek to, to cure something within your sector. If it is the finance sector, if it is the procurement, if it is WPD, that issue or your discussion should seek to cure some problem within your schedule. So you, you should go along and suggest recommendations for improvement on a specific governance issue. As I've stated, your write-up should be tailored to improve the university or the institutional governance. So the, the, the gist of a position paper is that it should be tailored to improve university or institutional governance. That is very important and that is non-negotiable. If you are, if at the end of the day, your paper doesn't offer very credible suggestions, then it was not worth uttering. It's important. So again, I just want to put more light on the outline. So you have your introduction, which is the problem statement. What is it, the issue? And uh, for instance, I will, I, will, I will use the training and development unit to make a point. For instance, whilst working at the training and development unit, I realized that lecturers, some lecturers who went on study leave refused to come back after their further studies. And that was draining the university. They were losing a lot of manpower where, where our budget was being run down because the universities paid all those staff for the number of years that they stayed, right? So the issues that, that came to fore was, what, what is the quota of invest? When we are writing a page, such a paper on the refusal of lecturers to come back after training, you need to look at one, what is the quota of investment of your institution that goes into training and development? So you should do a research and find out and have figures annually how much does the university pay for training and development. Then you should go further to look at the pull and push factors. Why is it that people go out and they don't want to come back? What is keeping them there? What is in your institution that they don't want to come back? You should do some research to know the quantum of loss to the university. Annually, how many of the lecturers refuse to come back and what is the cost to the university? then you should also do some research and, and pen down lessons that other staff who might be thinking of going and not coming back, what, 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 what they should know, right? Or the reasons why you feel that they should come back. Then when you get to the recommendation stage, you should be able to state measures that the investor will put in place such that staff who go out will definitely come back. And in our university, we have a bond 
which you any staff going out will necessarily have to sign at the high court, and he has to be guaranteed by two senior members. And the idea is that when they fail to come back, we will fall on the GUSS or the benefits of the senior members. So the writing of uh, signing of the bond and then uh, having two guarantees who are senior members is, has been one of the panaceas that we in UDS have used to ensure that staff come back. When they don't come back, they are surcharged, their guarantees will have to pay. And so it's, it's, so this is a typical problem, right? So coming back to the issue, I have stated that it should be a very serious issue. You don't just write on anything at all. For instance, why I did, why I did a paper on the TND was that the Public Accounts Committee, I was the Public Accounts Committee, they rebuked some technical universities for paying staff to go on steady leave and uh, failing to recover monies that they had paid to them for staff who refused to come back. There have also been external audit queries from the Auditor General's office, uh, querying university finance directors and even surcharging them for refusal or failure to recover amounts from staff who have gone on steady leave. So you should have all this data to support your argument you should have the data from external auditors, please. You should have the public data from the Public Accounts Committee, and you should have examples of finance directors who have been searched for failing to recover monies that staff were paid. You know, so when you do that, you you have you you understand you state clearly how serious the issue is, and this will be a basis for you to do your write up, and then you further go on to give your specific recommendation. So literature review is very important. It should form part of your body. There should be a literature review on the issue. You should look at global examples. You should fish out for similar issues in other universities where we are now going global. So it's not your institution alone that is facing that problem. That problem could be a global problem. And you can get very good examples from other universities. Alternatively, as an administrator or a professional, you could talk with other colleagues from other universities. So the problems could be general, but as much as possible, when you come to recommendations, please try to localize your solutions because each university is, is uh, unique. And you, your, if you make a general or a sweeping recommendation, it might not as, uh, serve the purpose of university. So we should support our right to with credible local or global examples. We should support our writer with credible data from or on the topic. For instance, the number of, if you are using training and development or you are using steady leave, you should know the number of staff that are leaving your institution. Yes, you should have that data. And then you should also have the number of staff who are absconded and those who are refused to come back. And you should have the data on those who have come back. And then please, as much as possible, let's cite and reference our sources. Let's cite and reference our sources. Because as I told you, even though it is a position paper, it should have some red, uh, rudiments of a published paper. It should be very credible. Because uh, you, 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 you might find it going somewhere. And uh, if you don't cite or reference properly, you could be cited for uh, plagiarism, right? So in the position paper, administrators, and professionals must write and develop their thoughts as if they were writing it for a publication. Because in future, you could rework on a position paper and get it published. A number of write-ups or a number of position papers have been published after uh, some work has been done on it. So it's important that you, 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 you follow strictly the requirements for a, a published paper so that in future, you can publish it for a pub for publication. Now, I would like to throw more light on rec the recommendation. Your recommendations should clearly lead to improvement in the university governance, which I have always stated. One of the requirements of our university is that when you do a position paper, you should submit it to the registrar or your head, either the finance director. He should look at it, and uh, sometimes it will be discussed at a higher level. And some of your recommendations should, will be acted upon. It's not just about writing your paper and waiting for, uh, uh, waiting for the time for you to submit it for promotion. 
when you write it, you should submit it to your registrar and there should be evidence. At the appointments and promotion committee, sometimes they look for evidence that your suggestions or your recommendations were worked on. So it's not just about writing. What you write should clearly go to the university management and there should be some evidence of your recommendation being acted upon. It's very important, right? So for administrators and professionals, there are a variety of areas. The spectrum is very broad. You can write on steady leaf and other forms of leaf if there are problems or some bottlenecks. You can write on promotions, placement, appointments. You can write on finance. For instance, processing of salaries, contracts and retirements. These are areas. Qualification for allowances, budgeting, procurement irregularities, bottlenecks and the transport system, supervision, motivation, job satisfaction, security, health and sanitation on campus. These are all areas that you can write on. So the, 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 the spectrum is endless, it's limitless. You can write on a variety of issues, but the most important thing is that it should be important to the governance of the university. It should contribute to improve university governance. So as a caution or a, a, a kind of suggestion to colleagues, your recommendation should not be very grandiose. They should be very simple, very practical, feasible, and implementable. So these three, th three things are very important when you are writing a position paper. Your position or your recommendation should be very practical, it should be very feasible, and it should be implementable by management at no cost or at a minimal cost. If you go and give suggestions or recommendations that will entail a very big budget, in, in, in the face of uh, uh, the meager resources confronting the investors, I think that management will, will have to think twice before looking at your suggestions. So your suggestions should be practical, it should be feasible, it should be implementable at no cost or at a very minimal cost. Yes, that is very important. So that, 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 that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Edrisu um, Tanko, for your presentation. Um, we would have to move on to the next presenter, but I will have to do a quick uh, introduction. I have to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Evelyn Bento, Director, Guidance and Counseling and Career Development at the ATU, and also Mrs. Sylvia B. Opponents, uh, Registrar at the ATU. Uh, our next speaker, will be Dr. Evelyn Bento and Mrs. Sylvia B. Upon Mensa. Um, if you're ready, we're ready for you, um, Dr. Evelyn Bento and Mrs. Sylvia B. Upon Mensa. I'm going to talk about qualities of a good report. You must aim for clarity. You have to explain your ideas as clearly and simply as you can. You have to imagine you are explaining your findings or your ideas to your grandmother or a friend at the pub. Avoid the use of jargons, and if there are terms, you may want to explain them so that your readers may know what you are referring to. You have to work from an outline. It's ideal to create a, a point form outline of the ideas you want to cover in your article or your report before you start writing. Although your plans may change, as the article or report develops. The outline is a good place to start. You must be aware of, be aware of the 80-20 rule. The 80-20 rule in writing suggests that you can probably generate about 80% of your writing or content in 20% of the time. So just focus on putting your ideas on paper. Just put the ideas, the thoughts, everything on paper. Don't bother about the, how messy it may be. You can always go back and then have them edited. As uh, the first speaker was speaking, they all gave format for writing reports and then the second speaker also gave format for writing position paper. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should start from the first session, to the second, third, and then fourth up to the end. You can start from any session at all. If you feel that you write your recommendations first, you are free to do so. 
any session that you feel comfortable starting with, you are free to do so. As I said, you can always come back and have your work edited. You must pay attention to your paragraphs. Discuss only one idea per paragraph and keep the paragraphs short. You may want to consider writing a paragraph of about 10 lines. The first line of each paragraph must tell the reader what the paragraph is about. You must also pay attention to your sentences. Avoid segment, sentence fragments. Use short sentences. And then if the sentence is more than three lines, probably it's too long, you might want to split the sentence up. Try to use the active voice instead of the passive voice. Identify who is doing the action and then put that person or that noun first. There are simple formatting styles that you can use to make your report easy to read and look organized and presentable. You may want to use one font throughout and then choose an easy to read font like Area or Times New Roman. These are best for reports. Session headings can have a different font if you so wish. If you want to use lists, you can break information into easy to understand points. You can number the list or have them bulleted. You can break your ideas into chunks, manageable chunks, and then you give them headings or subheadings. These headings will be found in the table of content, which makes it very easy for your reader to locate them. Like the first speaker said, you have to mind your grammar. The computer doesn't always identify our grammar. If you have to present the report to a group, for instance, management requires that you submit a report. You must make sure that you submit it to management and then you limit the circulation of the report to that particular group. And then the frequency of the report to also count. Decide whether you are going to be given a monthly report, a weekly report, quarterly report, or annual report, and then you work towards it. There are times that when you are writing, you remain, you become stuck. All your ideas somehow get lost. You, you don't remember anything. It's like you are short of ideas. What do you do in such times when you have the writer's block? You have to plan your shed in a way that it includes the time that you would have to put the writing on hold. Use flexible time schedules so that you will not be bothered by these uh, obstacles. And then make sure you write every day. Make writing part of a daily routine. Craft a few pages every day instead of cramming your work into long sessions before deadline. You may have to also stay, step away from your desk, go and get a snack or join a group and then have some fun or, then, or go to the gym, do something, go away from your desk for a while, you'll come back refreshed and you'll be able to continue your writing. You may also consider joining friends to do publications or to uh, engage, uh, embark on writing and tasks. This helps you get more projects to work on. At the same time, you get to learn from others how they are coping with their writer's block. When a report contains sensitive information, how do you handle it? You may want to store such reports in a locked cabinet against theft and unlawful access. The soft copies of such reports must be saved with the password. You have to ensure that the computer has an up-to-date antivirus. In this day of cyber, uh, theft and whatnot, you have to make sure that the computer has an activated firewall as well. If you have to dispose of such sensitive reports, you have to do it in a way that preserves their confidentiality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bento, for your presentation. Uh, Thank you. We will now have to move on. I think Dr. Mrs. Sylvia B. Opomensa Won't be won't be presenting, so we'll have to go to the questions and answers and discussion session. 
that is where I'll be doing it hand in hand with my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Glenn Jimma, to also assist in the moderation in the aspect of Q and A and discussion. So, to our participants, uh, with all the presentation that have been done so far, with the presentations from Dr. Idrisu um, Tanko, uh, Mrs. Caroline, and um, if you have any question or contribution or comment, you just put your hands up, uh, raise your hands and the participant uh, section, and then I'm going to call your name. If you want to type your question to, to be read, we'll also read it for you. So you have the liberty to raise your hands and you'll be called in to share your question and get an answer from our participants who are from our social guests and panelists who are also waiting. Thank you very much. So are there any hands for questions and answers, please? We had a hand risen up earlier by Linda Sion. If you can hear me, Linda, you can ask your question or share your comments. So we have the first one from Francis, who is asking, uh, I think this goes to Dr. Uh, Tanko, that can a position paper be published? Yeah, so uh, you, with your permission? Yes. Yes. I, I, when I was doing my presentation, I did state that when we are writing a position paper, you should incorporate in that paper all the rudiments of a, a published paper, right? You should look at your paragraphing, your, how you argue, and your citations and references. Because in future, you could work on it to an acceptable standard for publication. All right. I, I once did a paper on a, 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 a training and development as, as a position paper. And a year later, I worked on it and I got it published in the Ghana Higher Education Journal. So it's possible for you to publish the position paper, but not as a position paper. You will need to incorporate into it the rudiments of a published paper, right? Because a position paper sometimes is very short or it doesn't incorporate all the requirements of a published paper. You might, there will be literature review, fine. There will be a problem statement, fine. But there are other requirements for publication. And so, yes, you can, provided you improve upon it and incorporate into it the rudiments of a published paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tanko. So I think we'll give the opportunity to every one of our participants to also share their take on today's um, uh, webinar series and all that they've been able to gather in reports writing and position paper writing and also um, in all the reports that we've read and listened to today. Let's let's now get one from Senor Kwame Denichi, uh, who says that, please, will it be possible to have the recorded version? Yes. We will try and then work with the, uh, the speakers to share their uh, slides so we can share with you. So let, let's hear from what some of our participants on your take on today's um, presentation. Is Israel Tojo Aguji here? Israel, you can, you can unmute yourself and then um, share. Thank you for the presentation. And my comment is, is on the position paper writing. Uh, uh, as an administrator in the university, uh, we follow some institutional uh, hierarchy in, in writing some of us presenting our reports. Uh, when Doc was presenting, he mentioned that our report should mostly be submitted to our registrars for, for their notice and then implementation. Uh, apart from that, some of us work directly under line managers, and as such, we do not report directly to our registrars. So, assuming you write a position paper and your line manager is not comfortable that that particular position paper gets to the registrar, what do you do? That's my first question. Okay, so I think this goes to the Tata Tanko. Uh, I think he's noted that one. You can proceed with the next question, please. Okay. So secondly, uh, as we all are aware, investing governance is some, sometimes a very big, uh, difficult uh, uh, block to sometimes penetrate. Uh, you might have seen a very good uh, issue to write on. 
But uh, we all know sometimes how difficult management sometimes assumes its position. Sometimes they have some peculiar reason they want to take a particular decision and the decision comes out and you want to write about that particular decision with a, with a view that uh, it will enhance uh, proper management of the investing system. But uh, sometimes you write this without malice, but when it gets to them, uh, they take it in a painful manner. Meanwhile, it, in your own view, it is the truth. How do you manage some of these things? For instance, I have taken pains to write about some of these issues as investors are concerned before. But sometimes people are not comfortable that you have put this into writing. They rather want you rather to come and discuss verbally, which does not end anywhere and does not give you any evidence of contributing significantly to the university governance. As an administrator and a professional, how do you balance some of this? This is my second question. Thank you. Uh, Moderator, do I have your permission to respond? Yes, please, though. You can go ahead. Thank you. Um, th I'm thanking the, 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 the questioner or this, uh, the person making those suggestions. Yes, uh, the university, we have layers of authority. Definitely, for instance, as an assistant uh, accountant who works under an accountant, if you have noticed an anomaly or a problem in terms of salary processing, for instance, if you are in the payroll office and you are, you are an assistant accountant and you have an accountant heading payroll, I think that the most important to do is is to communicate. You know, communication plays a very important role, right? You need to engage your head. And it, your head should also know that that is a problem. It's a real problem. So they, they need, there's the need for a discussion between you and your head to, to agree that, yes, you have identified this problem and you think that you can put it on paper, express some sentiments or some recommendations. And... So please, the, the buy-in of your boss is very important. Once, and I, I, I don't think any other any person working in the interest of the university will say that no, we have identified this problem, and because of because I I might be part of that problem, don't write on it. Of course, we are human beings. Sometimes I have seen some position papers written, it goes to an authority, and they just they just dump it. But there will be an evidence of receipt because you will have to submit it to the main registry. They will stamp it and record it into their books. And that is an evidence that it, you have submitted something. So if they take it and they put it down and they don't act on it, that, that is no more your problem. You had a good intention of writing it. And then, so the balance, the balance will be that you, you should identify a common area. I don't think the finance director, the registrar, or any of your bosses will know that this is a problem. And because you have written on it, he, 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 will, he will disagree with you or he will take, I mean, he wouldn't be happy. So the, the whole thing is, is, is some kind of discussion. I mean, discuss with your immediate boss if you are, you, are, you are working under somebody. Discuss with the person. If the person doesn't see any eye to eye with you, please go to the next layer. If the head of payroll is not trying to uh, cooperate with you, there's somebody in front of the payroll head. Move to the deputy director of finance. Move to the finance director and tell them, look, I have identified this problem. And I think that I have some solutions. Can I write? And I, I think that every manager in the university will be happy to, to, to get some suggestions. So it's, it's, it's how we dialogue with, 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 with our, our big men, our registrars. I have written a lot of uh, position papers. I was, at, I was at training, I wrote some. I was at HR, I wrote some. I served at staff development, I wrote some. And they all went to the registrar. You know, so you should have a way of dialoguing and talking to your immediate boss to understand and agree with you that this is a real problem. And I think that any of these people, if they understand that these are real problems which need solution, I mean, they will gradually allow you to write. So that's, uh, you have to be tactical and use dialogue. I don't think we should adapt a combative or a, a confrontational problem. And I know it. it's only me who can suggest solutions. When you do that, you become combative, you become confrontational. And when you write, they will just ignore it. 
So let's do our homework well, let's dialogue, and let's talk with our big men before we put in. That, the civil service mentality is for you to discuss things before you write. And that is very important. So that's the bit that I can offer. Thank you. I'm sure one of some of the panelists can also add something to it. Thank you. Do we have any of our yeah. panelists who wish to contribute to this um, question from Israel? If we don't have one, we'll have to now go to Jonathan Kwame Lady. Uh, Jonathan, you can ask your question, please. Please, I want to find out the position paper is it needed before you rise to become a senior member, or is for those who are already senior members who are already administrators and they want to rise further? Uh, that's my first question. And I want to also find out, is there any difference between, or what's the difference between position papers and uh, research uh, proposals? Proposals, yeah, in uh, careers. The third one has to do with, I sent that, that one I sent it in the chat. I don't know whether you've seen it. Okay. I sent the third one in the chat, yeah. That one is about the recommendations. I don't know whether it carries as or it's just recommendation. Okay. Um, Dr. Tanko, did you get his two questions or he should go over again? I, I think the first question he wanted to know whether it is a requirement at senior, senior member level or at any, any level. Yes. And the second yeah, question okay. was that he wanted to know the difference between a proposal and a position paper. Right. So let me just look at uh, with the first question. Um, uh, if you are a senior staff, you, you yes. can write a position paper. Of course, it will help in the governance of the, the improved university governance. But for senior members, it is a requirement for promotion from assistant register and equivalent, assistant accountant, assistant procurement, assistant estates. It's, an, it's, it's, it's a requirement for promotion. The, and the number increases as you go high. You need six or seven for from the level of senior to, uh, from level of assistant register to senior assistant register, you need about 12 to get to a deputy registrar or more. So you can, you can write one as a senior staff, but it's non-scoring because you don't need it, actually need it for your promotion. Mm -hmm. Now the second question, a research proposal, of course, is, is when you, 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 you want to publish a paper, you first of all do a research proposal, which signifies your intent or as a roadmap for you to publish. So it's based on the proposal you do your publication. And a, pro, a, a position paper, first of all, the, the main import of a position paper is not for publication. But I did say that some one or two years after you have done your position paper, you can improve upon it and you inject in the rudiment of a, a publication to get it published. So there are, there are two different things. One is a requirement uh, 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 or the beginning of a, a getting a published paper, you need a proposal to carry on your research. But the position paper is just identifying a topical issue and then writing on it. It should be academic, that's what I'm saying. It should have some rudiments of publication, I mean, a problem statement, a literature review, a discussion, a very analytical discussion, and then a recommendation. Right. So after some time, if you decide that you want to turn it into a published paper, then you, are, you, are, you have to invoke the requirements of a publication. Is that right? So sure. thank you. Well, I think we have another one from Jennifer Entry, who says that Dr. Tanko made it clear in his presentation that the recommendations in a position paper can be used to make changes to solve problems identified at work. However, she wants to know if it will genuinely be used as a working tool to correct some problems. And this is from Jennifer Enchi to Dr. Tankwart. <laughs> uh, well, I have uh, again stated that, you know, the university has its own politics, right? But the import of writing a position paper is to, is to, is to cure a defect, is to solve a problem. So you as the person writing it, you, your intent is to get it to solve a problem. But as to whether it will solve that problem or it will help solve that problem, it's left to the discretion of management. I've indicated some managers 
will simply take your opposition paper. They don't even have the time to read it. They'll just dump it. Another person will read it. I, I have some other people who will take, who, he will refer it to, if you are, you are an assistant, you see an assistant registrar, and you want to get a deputy, he could refer it to a deputy registrar. Please look at this position paper. If there are some merits in it, let's, let's see whether we can adapt it and solve, this, uh, the, solve the problem. So it's sometimes it becomes a formality, but in many instances, management who, are, who have the interest of the institution at heart, they have relied on it to solve some problems. Right? So that is left to individual management and how serious they take these position papers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanko. Um, do we have any more questions, please, or comments? The floor is open now, uh, participants, to share your questions and comments, if there are any. Um, hello. Hello. I, I read in the chat somebody was asking about the recommend whether it should be recommendation or recommendations. Exactly. Yes. I think the, if you look at it from, from English point of view or grammar point of view, if it's only one recommendation you provide, then you would write recommendation without the S. If it's more than one, then you add that S to make it plural. But there are situations where at the end of the day, that whole uh, paragraph or that whole chapter is for recommendation. So you, the name, it will be just recommendation without the S. So it depends on, on which angle you are looking at it, whether you are providing just one or you are providing multiple, then it means you are looking at the grammar side. So you want to make the, without the S for one and then with S for more, uh, more than one. But where that chapter is a recommendation chapter or that particular part is recommended, then that the title will just be recommendation. And then it, it doesn't matter how many you provide over there. Thank you very much, um, uh, Caroline, for your submission on the issue of recommendations and recommendations. Uh, do we have any other comments or questions and as our panelists and special guests are here ready to respond to them? Well, let's, let's now hear from other participants and their view. Let's take your, have your take on today's program, um, if you would not share. So we have one from Mohammed Hadi saying, how long should a position paper uh, be? And should it contain references? Um, Dr. Tanko, if you can help us on this one. Yes, um, it, it depends on the problem you are writing on. I have, I have position papers that have been four pages, five pages, right? And four pages, five pages. I have another position paper which is which has been just three pages. So it depends on the issue you are writing on. Yes, and it should contain a reference list. It should, for purposes of uh, uh, saving your head from plagiarism and other other copyright issues. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Doc, for your submission. Um, I think if there's no further questions or comments. Hello. Hi. Hi, yeah. Doctor. Yes. yes. Thank you. I, I, I understand that, yes, sometimes the work politics does not allow the genuine recommendations to be take to use. For example, you have made a position paper and then you have realized that they have picked on some aspect, they have actually used it, but they refuse to acknowledge. If that is the case, what does the author do? I don't okay. know whether you understand my question. Yeah, I think Doc, doc, doc has... I don't understand your question very well. His, his impression tells that. All right, um, thank you. I, I, I think that you, you should even be happy that you have presented a number of recommendations and one or two have been acted on. As I said, in the last, my last slide, I talked about practicality and I used three, some three items that it should be very practical, it should be feasible, and then the cost. So sometimes you might make some recommendations. Management has the right or the discretion to pick and choose, right? They can look at what, what will work for them, what they want. So 
it doesn't lie within your bosom to, 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 to want to demand that all your recommendations should be implemented. At least you should be happy that one or two are implemented. There are instances, someone body will write and then they will just throw the whole paper away. Nobody will look at it. So there's nothing really that you can do. Maybe if you are at a personal level, you can prompt a member of management. So I, I wrote these recommendations and I saw that one and two have been used. I, I just wanted to know what happened to the other recommendations. Well, that's at a personal level. But uh, realistically, you don't have, you don't have the, 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 the prerogative to ensure that all your recommendations are implemented. Some never get implemented. And if some get implemented, please thank God. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. Do we have any more comments, questions, contributions? Okay, thank you very much at this moment. I want to say thank you to our speakers and also our participants who have asked questions to this point. Um, let's pick one last question by patients, uh, Eddie Kainbasi, uh, who says, please, is it data handling part of the qualities of a report? Uh, I think this goes to Dr. Bento. Uh, is data handling part of the qualities of report writing? Okay. When, when the first speaker was speaking, she explained uh, the different types of report writing. So if maybe you, there was a, um, a scenario, a situation you had investigated, and then you have had some data, you've analyzed it, you might want to include it in your reports. They are facts they want to include in your reports. So with that, you have to um, include the data in the reports. But if you have not done so, then you wouldn't want to put in anything that you haven't done. So that is my okay. answer. Thank you very much, Doc. Yes. Any more questions, please? Okay, so we have Mohammed Hadi. Um, your hand is up. Can you please unmute yourself and then share your comments? You have the permission to respond. Okay, yeah, yeah, yes, though you can you can uh, come in. Yes. The question is can a position paper be in the area of teaching and learning? Okay. It, 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 it can, because as, as administrators and professionals, we are supporting staff to our colleagues in the teaching profession. And so we 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 act as invigilators, we act as uh exam officers, and we, we, we do a lot of work that is related to teaching and learning. And so if in your wisdom, you are an exam officer in a faculty, and you have seen that there are problems in res with respect to how examinations are handled, there are problems with how examination results are handled, because at the core of teaching and learning is examination. The, examination, the way we handle the examination shows how credible or our outcomes in teaching and learning are. And so you can write a position paper about how to improve the conduct of examinations. And I think that that relates to the teaching and learning. Okay, you can have, for instance, when, when, when lecturers conduct exams, we keep, uh, we keep the scripts are given to us. In some institutions, administrators take the scripts administrators do the analysis of exam results in some universities. And so, as I said, examinations, results, and how they are conducted are at the heart of teaching and learning. And so if you can, if you see that there is really a problem in this area, you can do a position paper. And uh, that, that, that could also help in how exams are managed and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got um, less than 10 minutes to wrap up, so I'm going to give the chance to Jonathan. Your hand is up. Um, can we hear from you, please, Jonathan? Yeah, please, I'm back again. Um, please, I want more clarification on the difference between the proposal and the position paper. 
Uh, actually, before in the past, we were hearing of a proposal, maybe business proposal, that you want you want to write for this or that to be done within the organization or your department. So that uh, that uh, proposal, that one will have to write. What's the difference between? It, it doesn't mean the position position paper has replaced that word. Uh, that's what uh, that's the difference I actually want to get. Okay. Whether this position paper has replaced that uh, business proposal, sort of thing. Okay. So, Doc, over to you. Uh, thank you. I I think that I was very clear. A, a position paper does not replace a proposal. A proposal is, a, is, is different. A proposal is a requirement for research. It's a requirement for doing a publication, right? But a position paper is, is different. Even though technically speaking, a position paper can be, you, well, the, 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 the nomenclature is different or the classification. You, you, you can say that in a position paper, you are making a proposal, but you can't call it a proposal. Okay. Am I clear? Mm -hmm. yes, in a position yes. paper, you are making a proposal, but you can technically call it a proposal. Whilst mm -hmm. a proposal is a prerequisite for writing a research paper, a, a position paper is different. In a proposal, you have an introduction. In a position paper, you have an introduction. In a proposal, you have a statement of a problem. In a position paper, too, you do have a statement of a problem, but it's quite different and not as elaborate as that of a, pro, a research proposal. In a proposal, you have the methodology, but in a position paper, you might choose to ignore, there's nothing like a methodology. Of course, sometimes if you are doing some research, you can have a procedure. So there are two different things, but in, in our everyday usage of English, you can call a position paper a proposal because you are proposing something for managerial implementation, right? But there are two different things altogether. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so do we have any uh, further questions, please? Uh, hello, my hand is up. Yes, you can go ahead. Uh, uh, permit me to help the Mama? Uh, Dr. Tanko to elaborate on the position paper. Just to give a scenario uh, to clarify uh, other participants' view on the difference between a, a proposal and a position paper. No. No. Hello. 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 Can I help us? You want to throw more light on the difference between a position paper and a proposal? Sure. Yes. The question I take now is that somebody wants to know whether position papers are authenticated, like the case of articles. No, please. I have stated clearly and categorically that position papers are in house writing, in house publication that you write specific to an issue in your university. If you want it to be authenticated, that is if you want to make it a journal, you then have to infuse in the rudiments of publications to now make it a published paper which will be peer reviewed. And then you look for an authentic journal or a peer reviewed journal and you send it. So if you write a position paper in the form that it is, you cannot send it out for publication, right? You can't send it out for publication. You need to work on it. You need to make an improvement on it. And then before you can then send it out for publication, but it should be accepted in your institution. You submit it to your main registry, it is stamped and then forwarded to management, but it cannot be an accepted or an authenticated paper, like a paper that has been it's, uh, published in say, Sage, Elsevier and other publications. Thank you. There was somebody who wanted to help put light on a, if you can permit the person. Hello. Uh, so um, who wants to, uh, can, we, can we see you? Um... Yes. Yes. It's me, Israel. Okay, Israel, you can go ahead. So uh, one thing I've just realized that will help is that uh, for a position paper, from my understanding, it could serve as a critique of a particular policy 
of an institution or a practice that needs to be uh, uh, reformed or uh, uh, to be re-looked at. So you may have an issue going on or a policy that has been drafted or passed for implementation. And as a staff or as a professional in the institution, you critically assess the policy and you have a critique of it. Like Doc earlier on stated, it could be from both positive and negative aspects. Then you now take a stand from what you think should be the ideal situation, practicable enough for the policy. Or better still, it could be a practice that is being pursued or is going on in an institution that is injurious to a particular objective for that particular institution or goal, goal attainment. So in you, the author's view, you might critique that particular practice and offer an alternative solution for management to consider. That is what a, 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 a position paper may be. But like he already stated, for proposal or recent proposal, or a proposal that needs to solve another issue, it may not go through all the nitty gritties that probably might have happened with a position paper. This is one or two clarities I want to give concerning the position paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Israel, for your um, support in this uh, position paper for our participants to understand. Thank you very much, Doc, as well, for giving him the opportunity to also share in his views. Um, let's now take the very last comment that has been made by, um, by Patience. And she emphasizes that she meant data handling, not data adding, data handling um, to the reports. So I think, uh, Dr. Evelyn, um, Patience was referring to data handling, handling data, not adding data to the report. So she wanted to know if it was a requirement for a good report, data handling, if you could please um, throw more light to that for her. Okay, my understanding is that uh, we can generate reports from every task that we embark on. So if you are handling data, definitely how you handle it can be used for a report. So um, it's like if you handle it properly, you can uh, also report on it properly. So that's what I was talking about, adding data to your report. We virtually report, you can make a report on every task that you embark on. So I don't know whether I'm not getting the question, but I feel that uh, if you do it, if you handle data properly and use the right analysis, you'll be able to report it appropriately. So I think uh, the quality comes in when you handle the data uh, with the right and analytical tool. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Patience, um, you can also um, raise your hands or, or mute yourself and then throw more light to your question if you really want to um, help us to understand you more better. Um, you have the opportunity to do that, okay? Uh, hello, Doc. Just wanted to add a little to that. Hello. 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 Yes, ma'am. You can go ahead. I just wanted to, yeah. Basically, the data is the information that you have gathered to write your report. So, in terms of uh, handling it, you like uh, Evelyn said, you have to handle it in an appropriate way. You have collected that information that you need to write the report. That the technical is the data. So, if at the end of the day you do not use that information that you have gathered to be able to write a report in an appropriate manner. It will throw everything off balance. I mean, you will not be able to come up with factual information for your report. So that's how I understand what she wants to But If there's something she'd want to clarify, she should. But I basically think that data is just the information that you have gathered to be able to write your report, whichever direction you got the data from. So handling basically has got to do with how are you going to use that data? So if you use the data very well, it will, let, it will give you an authentic or credible report. If you don't use it very well, it will throw everything off balance. So uh, that's, that's a little I'd like to add with respect to data handling being something that, is it, is it something that you, you need to look at when it comes to 
coming up with a report. Thank you very much, Mrs. Caroline, for your support here. Um, I also want to take, okay, I think Patience in, in, is in here. Patience, if you're on, you can go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Patience. Uh, yeah, even, yeah, I can hear you. In her presentation, she made mention of um, looking for a, a locket where to keep the data. That is why I'm referring to data handling. It's not, about, it's not the usage of the data. It is the handling aspect that she talked about, like how we keep the data, where we keep the data. That's why I'm asking whether that is part of the qualities. Oh. It's, it's not clear. I'm not getting the question. What I was referring to is that sometimes it's like your report contains sensitive information about an individual or some uh, conditions at the workplace. You see, and this is not good for everybody's... Uh, uh, sites or consumption. So it's like you may want to keep those uh, information, the reports on such a uh, condition or situations in a locked drawer. It's not everybody who, has, who must get access to it. Friends come to your table, they might want to see what is on the table. I think it's like it's for everybody's uh, consumption, but then it's for just for a specific few. So you have to keep it in a locked drawer. If it's, if it's on this uh, computer, it, that's a soft copy. You must make sure you save it with the password. And then the computer, these days of cyber uh, theft and here and there, you might want to have a, an up to date antivirus as well as a, a, an activated firewall so that you are sure that your data is safe on your, or your report, the information in the report is safe on the computer. I am a clinical psychologist, so the information I handle mostly is sensitive. That's how I'm trying to uh, explain things from that line. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Doc. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. Um, is so it I, clear now? Yeah, it's okay. Thank you very much, Doc, for your explanation. All right. So Thanks. in the absence of more questions and comments, I think I would have to now switch to my co-moderator, Dr. Glenn Jima, to bring us our closer, a, a, a remark, I think, from, from his end. Dr. Jima, if you can hear us, you can go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Ajima. Uh, it's been a very exciting moment, actually. Uh, the speakers and then the panelists, they've really made our day. Um, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to express my appreciation to the speakers um, and the panelists for their valuable contribution uh, to our webinar program uh, on the team that we have for this particular session, that is the CIS edition, trends in academic writing and publishing in an ongoing pandemic. Um, my deepest gratitude also goes to the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Mevi, for sparing part of his time with us in sparing us up with the good work that the ATU library is doing. Uh, we also want to appreciate all the participant who made time to join our webinar program and had helped to make it such a great success. We are very grateful to all of you. ATU and AAU as an academic institution have a, a lot of things in common and we have a common mandate as well to oversee the development of both staff and students uh, to be able to meet the demand on them even as they cope with their activities in their daily life. Uh, hearing and learning from speakers and panelists, as well as the audience, their contribution, uh, it has really educated us and all of us are a witness of all that we've heard in the area of the arts of academic report writing for non-teaching staff and the mechanism of writing position papers as a tool for professional development that is connected to their promotion. Uh, it is very important to state here that hearing their views from this uh, platform had really been an encouragement, particularly on the subjects that we all have been a part of. It's really encouraging. And so um, I must say here that uh, in my capacity as a co-facilitator of this event, I thought it would be very appropriate to make some useful summary to the sub teams that had been uh, shared. Uh, and to do that, I think the webinar 
has been very, very effective and had been able to meet the purpose for which it was intended for, that is to have an overview of the art of academic report writing for non-teaching staff in the various areas of report writing and the presentation that has been made to us. Then the other area also is to examine the mechanisms of writing a position paper. It has also been well presented and uh, I know the participants had really enjoyed and then to end it all to the discussion that has also prevailed, that has exposed us to the various challenges that the non-teaching staffs are facing. Um, secondly, uh, following on these sub teams for the discussion, uh, there were some other number of issues that are very important and very interesting point that I want us to have a look at. Um, all of our speakers have acknowledged the fact that all staff, in the academic institutions are uh, academic staff. And therefore, with everything that we are doing, it has to be done in the most, let me say, uh, let, I don't want to use the word scientific, but must be under a evidential base, whereby we can defend it and it can help impact on everything that we are doing. Then it was also noted that promotion as for the non-teaching staff is connected with the writing of their report. And therefore it must be done with all the necessary information required to make sure that they are able to attract the management attention to allow them to be promoted. There's also the need that the writing should also make the needed impact in the local environment. It should be very practical. It should be very uh, simple and it must also be very feasible. These are some things that we all acknowledge that in, as we move on with the issue of ensuring that we have our position paper accepted, it must be in it. And for that matter, I want to end my closing remarks uh, by just saying that uh, um, we have a lot of thanks to offer onto our guest speakers and also the panelists who join us. We are highly grateful. And then also to ATU Library uh, and that of the ATU Directorate of Research, um, Innovation, Publication and Technology Transfer who have invested so much in making this project or uh, this particular webinar a success. We want to say we are very grateful and we are proud of them. And then I can't end my remarks without expressing my deepest thanks to the cause of the AAU Secretariat. They had been able to host our program and have shown a priceless contribution to our activity that we've all witnessed today. And so I must say a big thank you to you all and may God bless you and hope to see you in any other edition that we may have to meet through this medium again. May God bless you and thank you for being part of our session. Thank you very much, Dr. Glenn Jema, for your very candid and a very remarkable uh, remark right there. Um, I'm also glad to serve as your moderator today, uh, representing my boss, head of IT, uh, Mr. Abed Quality, who choose I'm feeling here today to work with you on this very educative webinar series. I think it's been very, very fruitful, learning how to write reports and uh, making it known that everybody in the university setting isn't, it's all it's, uh, an academic and shouldn't think that you're not academic, you're part of the academic movement. So you have to write, which research we say is the habit of life. So you have to cultivate the habit of reading and learning and also writing each every day. Thank you very much to Mrs. Caroline for instilling the thoughts that we always need to write. Writing is very important. And also our report writes and helping us to understand how to write our reports, academic reports, and also how to know, uh, get things done right in our reports writing. I would also want to say a big thank you to Professor Samuel Niwodai, Vice Chancellor for the Academic University for um, making it work, making this program work. We were glad you, you, you sanctioned the event for us. We also want to say a big thank you to Dr. Idrisu M. Tanko for your uh, 
um, knowledge sharing ability to help us understand how to write position papers very well and also explaining to our participants how we well to differentiate between a position paper and a proposal. Also, a big thank you to Dr. Evelyn Bentil for also sharing with us the qualities of a good report. I really want to um, do what has been done by Dr. Glenn. So I'll just say thank you very much to all our special guests and uh, pa uh, panelists also and participants for making time for the first edition for the ATU webinar series seminar. I believe that the next one will come and AAU will be available to support uh, this good cause since our mission is to always uh, help lift the relevance of higher education in Africa and also address the needs of higher education within our country and the continent as well. So thank you very much for your time with us on this program. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Thank you. Hi. So on this note, um, we can bring the meeting to a close. Dr. Glenn, you, right. can, you, can, you can pass a word on that to the closure. Oh, right. I think uh, it's been a very exciting, as I said, and I know that everyone who have joined has really learned a lot. I have really learned a lot. And uh, it's a great blessing to be part. So God bless you all and hope to see you another time. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.